Scene number 230. <clears throat> 230. Now I've heard the number this time. Did, did, last time we messed it up, didn't we? No, Plus, I guess uh, we said 330 last time. Yeah, didn't we? Thank mm -hmm. you. Just start saying we'll just this side out. We will try.
get your Bibles out with me tonight. Look to the Lord's Word. There's some more guidance. We're going to be starting, we're going to continue in Acts chapter 18. Start in verse 24. Not quite as much reading tonight as we had this morning. So Acts chapter 18, and starting in verse 24. So when you find that, stand with me. Welcome all of those that's joining us online. I've uh, I enjoy being able to go back and see who all joins in with us. So uh, put a post on there every once in a while. Let us know you're with us and. It's an encouragement to us to have you with us, so you're welcome to join us anytime. We've got a few different ways that you can watch. You're probably watching Facebook Live, and we also have on YouTube, and uh, recently discovered you can watch it on your TV through both of those ways, too, with some of the right apps. So if you don't know how to do that, start asking, and you'll figure it out. It's a little bit easier. Acts chapter 18 and verse 24 it says, in a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man, and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto them the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Y'all may be seen. Lord, we come to you tonight, and I first just want to thank you for, thank you for allowing us to feel your spirit this morning. Your spirit can be felt in so many different ways, Lord, but I just thank you for the liberty that was felt here this morning and the love amongst our brothers and sisters this morning. And Father, I just wish, I would desire to be able to have that every single Sunday. Lord, we bring in our sin too often. We bring in our distractions too often. We bring in our selfishness too often, Father. And we know that it would be your desire also. But Father, I just pray that you just grant us your grace one more time tonight. Would you speak to us through your scriptures and help us to see that which you would have us to see? And we come to a tough scripture tonight, Father, one that is no doubt much easier to preach than it is to live out. But Father, help us to, to take this meat and Lord, to digest it and help it to, to make us stronger for you. We love you and thank you for those that have come out and joined in tonight. I pray that you pass a blessing on their way. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <clears throat> Tonight's scripture, we uh, come to a new man that we've not talked about before. His name is Apollos. And uh, you might have saw his name in scripture. It comes in a few times, not a whole lot, but this man was, was much greater and had a much greater influence than the scripture's can really relay. He had a, we can tell by what was said about this man that he made a big impact in this time when, uh, when the Lord was calling on people to spread the gospel. But this man had a problem. And I'm afraid it's the same problem that a lot of us have still 2,000 years later. Uh, and the best way I know to say it is... Uh, this man was, was being washed in dirty water. Being washed in dirty water. And if you notice what it said about this man, it said that all he knew in verse 25 was knowing only the baptism of John. 
And we knew the baptism of John was the baptism of repentance. So we have two different things that I want to look at tonight. And we see that baptism of repentance, which we know is very important and we must have. But then we also know the grace that comes with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the two things I'll start off by showing you is we have repentance and we have grace. And the unique thing about this is that we can have repentance. We can experience God's, uh, we can experience God's grace. Or actually, we cannot experience God's grace until we experience God's repentance. Until we get that. But you can experience repentance without grace. Now, I'll let you digest that for a second. But it's an important thing for you to understand before we start. That you can experience repentance without grace. But you can not experience grace without repentance. And that's what we have here tonight, and that's what is going on at this time is the grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ was just being introduced to a lot of people, and this man only knew repentance. He didn't know the grace of Jesus Christ. And I want to show you real closely in here, in just these few verses, there's a great message that I think that our church in our day and time has not got figured out yet. I, I think that there's a message within these scriptures that Salem Baptist Church has not got figured out yet. I think there's a message within these scriptures that me as your pastor, unfortunately, has not got figured out yet. And I think that we have got to spend some time trying to fully understand this. But I think that Aquila and Priscilla had it figured out. So we're going to look to them and see what they can teach us uh, about this where where Apollos was being washed in dirty water of just repentance Aquila and Priscilla knew a better way and I want to show you that tonight what this better way actually was and instead of just being washed in dirty water the first thing that I will tell you is Aquila and Priscilla if y'all remember from them this morning husband and wife the tent makers much help to Paul traveled around, they were traveling evangelists, and, and they were on fire for the Lord during this time, knew the scriptures, but then they also knew something else that Apollos didn't know. And what they wanted to show him was a better way to get washed. And I, I, as I was thinking about this and putting this together, I was recently hanging out with uh, my wife's grandma, and she was telling me about a time that uh, back in the day, I guess I will say, before electricity, before hot water and hot water heaters and all that, she said in the summertime, they would actually go out on the porch and they would fill a big barrel up full of water. Jean shaking her head. She may have took the plunge herself at one point in time, but they would fill a big barrel up and all the kids and the whole family, it would be bath day. And, and she made a point to tell me, she said it, you learned real quick that you wanted to be one of the first ones to take the bath, not the last ones to take the bath. And so that's what we're experiencing here is it's not fun and it's not enjoyable and it's not purposeful to be washed in dirty water. So God has another purpose for us. That's why he, he came. That's why Jesus Christ came is to show us this new and better way. And what I want to tell you tonight is what you must be washed in, the soap that you must be washed in is sound understanding. And that's what we've got to start with tonight. We've got to find sound understanding within these scriptures. Apollos didn't have understanding. Aquila and Priscilla did have understanding. And if you want to understand what they knew and figure out this better way, we must find understanding. And we think of that and we find understanding by what? Rightly dividing the word of truth, right? We remember, we know in 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that, that needeth not to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what we are called to do. And I know you've heard that scripture. I know you've heard it many times, but I feel like in our day and time, the different denominations, the different churches, we wouldn't have so many if we knew how to rightly divide the word of truth. 
It would be the church of God. It would be God's church. We would all be one church. This is where we struggle is rightly dividing the word of truth. So uh, let me take you back and to help you find understanding of this, we've got to go back a little bit. If you remember one of my life verses that I live by is Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 and 2. If you want to go back there and look, you can, but these are the seven spirits, right? The seven spirits that every Christian should strive to have in their life. As they grow as a Christian, God will send you these spirits to make you a better Christian. We started off with, and I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you that Apollos had a lot of these. Apollos had the fear of God. The scriptures told us that he was on fire for the Lord. He had the fear of God. It said that he had knowledge. It told us that Apollo was well instructed in the way of the Lord. That was the second one. If you're going from the bottom up, like I told you that we must do, it's kind of a stair step that we can find that we lead into as a Christian. So he had the fear. He had the knowledge. It says he also had might because it talks here about how that he was boldly, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. So he had might and he was talking to a lot of different people. He had counsel. He was teaching them about the word of the Lord and he had great counsel. But then that's where he stopped. That's where he stopped. He had four of the seven, but that's where he stopped. And I feel like most of us, if we're honest with ourselves, we probably don't even have the four that Apollos had. But Aquila and Priscilla kept on going a little bit farther. And the next one of those spirits that you must have is guess what it is? It's understanding. After you have these things, you can't get any farther in getting to the spirit of the Lord until you have sound understanding. And that's what Apollos and or that's what Aquila and Priscilla had, and that's what they was trying to get him to understand. And what that understanding was, as we see here, Aquila and Priscilla, they used grace to teach grace. They used grace to teach grace. Let me show you what I mean by that. In verse 26, it says, And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, who when Aquila and Priscilla had heard. They took him unto them, all right, you get that, and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. The way of God more perfectly. So what they did is, that is, they knew that he didn't understand grace yet. So they was going to use grace to teach him grace. Now notice how they used grace to teach him grace. They used grace to teach him grace, right? Because notice it says that they didn't stand up in the middle of the synagogue and says, no, you're wrong. You're teaching it wrong. You're, you're wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. They didn't do that. They didn't make a big scene out of it. They didn't cause division within the church. They didn't call a deacon's meeting to say, hey, we've got this major problem that we got to deal with. They didn't start talking to other people about it and say, yeah, he's a good guy, but let me tell you, he don't know what he's talking about because if you look at this scripture and this scripture, then that ain't right. They didn't do that. It says that they expounded, they, they took him unto them. I can almost picture how this happened. The Bible don't specifically tell us, but I know since they had understanding and they had wisdom, and I know that they was using grace and knew how to use grace, they probably just after the service, after everything was over with, they probably invited him over for supper. They said, hey, let's go out and get some chicken. They probably went out and they talked to him and just fellowshiped with him and said, hey, I, I really enjoyed your message today. It was a lot of truth, and they probably asked him about his experience. They asked him about when he got baptized, and then they told them about a new baptism. They talked about the baptism of John, but they said, well, have you heard about Jesus Christ and what he did? Did you hear what about what Jesus said about baptism, about how John baptized with water, but he would Jesus would baptize with the Holy Ghost? Do you see that? I, and I can almost picture Aquila and Priscilla doing this, but doing it in the right way because they have understanding. They have wisdom. If you ever want to help somebody else out, if you want to help another Christian out, if you want to fellowship as Christians, you've got to use good understanding and sound wisdom and grace in order to be able to do that. Or you're just going to divide like we're doing this in this day and time. We divide as churches and we say, well, I don't want to go to that church. They believe they're a bunch of hypocrites over there. They believe this, they do this, they do that. Let's figure out a way to be able to come together. And 
And again, I know this is easier to preach than it is to live it. But I believe this is what God's word is telling us to do. So we must heed to it. We must listen to it. We must at least try to be able to fill this gap. So if you're washed with the soap of understanding, if you want to think about it like that, then you must be rinsed with grace is what Aquila and Priscilla told them that you must do. Told them you must do. Because see, washing with understanding, you can understand something, but if you don't ever rinse it off with grace, then all you've got, if you just got soap and I'm dirty and I wash up with soap and I lather up with soap real good, and don't do anything else, then all I am is just a, a big dirty soap ball, right? I just got dirty soap all over me. I understood what I needed to clean me up. It may have killed the bacteria, but it, it, it hasn't filled the full purpose until I rinse off with the grace of God, with the grace that, that Jesus Christ brought us. Understand that grace is Jesus Christ. And it's very closely related to forgiveness. Grace is very closely related to forgiveness, which means that if you want to have grace with somebody, then you automatically have to have a forgiving heart. You have to go into whatever that situation is, knowing that they may be right and you may be wrong, or you may be wrong and they may be right, whatever it is, but you're going to have a forgiving heart to try to actually learn from that. Even if you know you're right, You've got to be able to go into that situation with grace, thinking that maybe nobody's taught them the right way. Nobody's, maybe nobody's taught them the right thing. So you've got to be able to go into these situations with grace. Why am I telling you all this? Because I believe with all my heart that you may go out with the good intentions like Apollos did. You may go out and you may know the word of God. You may know that somebody is living in sin. You may know that somebody is doing something wrong. You may be bold enough to bring it to their attention. But if you don't do it in the right way, then you're just going to turn them away even farther. You're never going to mend that relationship that Jesus has called us to mend. I believe this is the message that the church needs to understand. And the way we do that is just think about Jesus. Jesus is that grace. Let me give you some scripture to be able to help you understand that even more. In, in John 1, verse 14 through 17, you don't have to turn there, you can, but I want to read these verses to you. It says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bare witness of him and cried, saying, This was he of whom I spake. He that cometh after me is preferred before me. He was before, for he was before me. And of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. I'll explain that more in just a minute. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. I think that Aquila and Priscilla probably used a message something like that. They probably talked to Apollos and was telling him and, and, let, and explained to him that Jesus Christ brought us grace which we never had before. So basically what, what this message says is that we receive grace by grace so we can understand and be washed in grace. Has everybody got that? Isn't that graceful? That's real graceful, isn't it? That's, but that's what happened. Jesus Christ is that grace that we needed. Jesus Christ is that grace that we had to have. If you want to get back to the, the illustration, and, and the Bible does it, I don't do it, but we're actually washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what we're rinsed off in. We have all the sin and we take this understanding and we, we clean it off of us and we see it as it bubbles up and we see that sin and we know that it's there, but it's the blood of Jesus Christ is the only thing that can rinse that off of us. It's nothing that you do. It's not because you're smart enough to be able to go to clean water and rinse it off. Water won't take care of it. They done told him that. John had water, but water won't take care of it. The blood of Jesus Christ is the only thing that is graceful enough to be able to take care of the sin that me and you carry around with us every day. You know what that means? That means that you're no better than anybody else. 
That means that they're going to have to get washed by the blood of Jesus Christ just like you did. That means that you're not the one giving them the answers to all their problems. You're just pointing them to the man that can solve all their problems. You don't have the blood. You can't take the blood and pour it on them and, and rinse that off of them. Only Jesus Christ can. Have you ever experienced that before? You, you, want it, you have all the answers. You know what can change somebody's life. You know it all right here. You know the perfect and the right thing to say. But it's not just words. They've got to experience Jesus Christ for themselves. They have to be washed by Jesus Christ himself. They have to believe for themselves. They have to seek a relationship with him themselves. It's not just us. But we can point them to that grace. That's what we're actually called to do. And if you want to look up further and you're taking notes, you can see, understand more that blood that if you want to look at Revelation chapter 7, it talks about that blood a little bit. And you start to understand that it's all about the blood of Jesus Christ is that grace. So we gotta we gotta wash up with that, we gotta wash up with understanding, we've got to rinse off with that grace with the blood of Jesus Christ. But then there's there's more here too. Because if any time you go take a bath, the whole purpose of taking a bath is you wash up, but then what are you going to do? You're going to put some clothes on, right? I hope. I think that's the next thing. It's the next step that we're going to do. So we're called to wash in understanding. We're called to rinse in grace and let Jesus wash us and have that grace with us and everyone. But then we're supposed to be clothed in righteousness. Clothed in righteousness. Let me explain that to you a little bit. That's a, that's a fancy word that sounds real nice, but let me tell you what that really means to be clothed in righteousness. See, people can't see what's inside your heart. They can't, you can't see inside my heart. All you can see is what I've got on. You can see the clothes that I've got on. When you're clothed in righteousness, that is your witness to everyone else around you. That is what they see when they look upon you. Is they're, they're looking at you and they're trying to understand you. They can't see inside until you have some deep conversations with them or until you're in a, in a place where you can spiritually bear some of their fruit. But just at a first glance, all you can see is just look upon them. Look upon them. So to be clothed with righteousness is, is to hide with inside you the full knowledge and the grace of God, but knowing how to give it out with wisdom. That's the key. It's, 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 it's having meekness. It's knowing a whole lot more than you let on you know. It's knowing what the answer is, but you've got enough understanding and wisdom to only give them enough a little at a time for what they actually need. Because some people, and, and we're bad about this, we, we get all fired up for the Lord just like Apollos was fired up for the Lord. He went out and he was telling everybody about everything, but he didn't have the whole story. And so what he was doing is he was just washing a bunch more people in more dirty water. If you go out and you don't have this, if you're not clothed in righteousness and not have this good understanding, that's all you're going to be doing is washing other people in dirty water. <coughs> But here's what we're supposed to be doing instead. And, and Paul understood this. Paul understood this. Let me, here's what he said in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. It says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. Paul understood he had good understanding. He had good wisdom. He knew that you just didn't throw down a big steak, ribeye steak dinner in front of a baby and say, eat it. We've got to go out and not only have grace with people, but we've got to understand and learn to read people and know what it is that they need. Sometimes they don't need us to be able to quote the whole book of Isaiah to them and just lay it all out there to them. Sometimes they just need to say, hear the words, God loves you. Maybe they, that's all they need is just that milk. Don't take on the pressure of yourself of 
thinking that you've got to go out and give all this meat and lay it in front of somebody when all they need is just some milk. Because that's really what it's all about anyways. See, Paul understood that the substance is actually, we know the important thing. But the substance and the nutrients of that protein of that steak dinner and all that stuff, he knows that in order to get there, what's really going to attract them is the taste of it. And that's why we know in the Old Testament it says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's what we're supposed to be doing is just going out and giving people some grace and we're supposed to be giving them a taste of God's love. That's how we go out and witness to people. That's this being clothed in righteousness. When they see us out in the public, we should just be glowing with God's love and it should attract them. It should give them a taste of what God really has in store for them. We may want to go up to them and we may fully want to just talk to them about salvation and talk to them how it's got to come through humble repentance. You got to do this and that and this and that, but they may not be ready for that part yet. They may just need to be hearing about God's love. And you can do that just by living, by living by good example, letting them see what God has done for you, letting them see that there's something different about you that other people don't have. That's step one. That's giving them a taste for God. That's being clothed in righteousness is what that's talking about. That's what we understand that to be because that's what really people are actually seeing. Otherwise, we're just becoming a stumbling block for them. When you try to do it the wrong way, when you try to witness without understanding and wisdom, then you just become a stumbling block for them. And you may actually hurt them more than you're going to help them. That's cold, hard reality. Let me tell you just a little bit more about this, this uh, being clothed in righteousness. In Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10, I'm giving you all a lot of scripture to chew on tonight. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. This is what we're supposed to do. If we want to go out and we want to be a good witness for the Lord, people should be able to look at us and we should have some ornaments on us that attract people's attention. We should be dressed nice in, in the love of God that it gets people's attention when they look at us. We should, we should be nice dressed. We should look nice. We should act nice. We should feel nice. Think about a, a, a bride that just got through getting married. She's proud. She looks beautiful. She's got on that white dress. She's got on all the jewelry. She's got on everything. And she represents that day well. She's very proud of that. But where did that jewelry come from? She probably didn't buy it with her own money. Where did that nice dress and everything come from? She probably didn't buy it with her own money. It's a, it's a sign of what God has done for you, what somebody else has done for you. Somebody else probably bought that dress for her. Somebody else probably bought that expensive jewelry for it. It's showing the love that somebody else has for you. So it's not showing your own self-righteousness. You're not clothed in self-righteousness, but you're clothed in God's righteousness. When somebody looks at you, you're going to point right back to God. And you're going to say, yeah, my life is good. I'm full of love. I don't handle problems the same way the rest of the world way does. I know I'm different. I know I shouldn't be crying, but instead I'm rejoicing and I have the joy of my salvation. I'm different because he made me different. I'm different because he put a robe on me that's different. He put a robe of righteousness on me. And so whatever comes my way, I'm righteous, not because I'm righteous, but because he's righteous. Because he's already cleansed me with understanding and rinsed me off with his blood of grace, and that's why I'm righteous, because of him, not because of anything that I did. Do you see this? Aquila and Priscilla knew a better way, and we've got to go out, and we've got to witness to people with grace. We've got to go out, and we've got to witness to people with this love and being clothed in righteousness. 
And I believe this, the church is, has a problem with this. I believe we all have a problem with this because we don't want to have grace with each other because we're so stubborn that we're just convinced that our way is right and there is nothing else that we can learn about our way and the way we believe and the way that it is. But ultimately, <coughs> God's word and the word was flesh. The, the gospel of Jesus Christ is what we should stick to. That's the truth. That's what we've got to go back to. We've got, we can, when we debate things with people, we've got to go back to the word to decide what is right and what is not right. It's all about the word. That's what's right. That's what's righteous. But we've got to have that love. And I'm closing with this. I'll tell you that the world knows if we're washed in dirty water or if we're washed in something different. They can smell it on you. If you're washed with dirty water, no doubt somebody can probably smell it on you, right? I'm telling you, the world can smell it on us. If, if we're just going out and we just had this thought of repent, 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 repentance with no grace, when you walk up to them, they're going to shut you off and you ain't going to a bit more get to witness to them than anything. But you speak of grace. You speak of love. And you let them know that their sins can be forgiven. You let them know that there's nothing that they've done that Jesus wouldn't forgive. You let them know that you're not perfect also. You let them know that you have no self-righteousness, but the only righteousness that you have is from God himself through Jesus Christ and washing your sins away. You start to have those conversations with them. All of a sudden, you've got their heart. All of a sudden, you've got their ear. Our smell will tell if we've washed in the right understanding. And they're watching and listening to see if either grace or hypocrisy is being applied. Most of the time, they see hypocrisy because we're not giving out enough grace. They see hypocrisy because we want to point out all their flaws, but we don't want to admit our own. It's okay to let somebody else's know what's sin. If they think what they're doing is not sin, it's okay. We're supposed to do that as Christians. But in the same breath, you should also let them know that, hey, I've got sins too, and I'm working on it, and I ain't got it all figured out. That's why I'm going to church. That's why I have to be washed. See, through salvation, you get washed once. We know that. But to live a clean life, to live a righteous life, you're going to have to go through this step. A lot. You're going to have to go back to sound understanding and wash some more sin off of you. You're going to have to go back to the grace of God and say, God, I messed up again, and let his blood wash that off of you. You're going to have to put that righteousness back on again and say, okay, I, I know I didn't deserve it. I had to get washed up again, but Lord, you've got some clean clothes on me. I'm going to go out here and I'm going to try to witness for you again. We're going to have to do that time and time again. Let's let it be God's righteousness that's on us, not our own self-righteousness. Let's not let our stubborn and our pride get in the way of being a good witness to somebody. Put yourself in their shoes. See what they're, see from their perspective. Try to see where they've come from. Try to look at maybe the Christian hypocrites that's been in their life and why they have such a bad taste for us. I think the Lord's word is telling us this because once again, there's a lot of people out there in Cave City. There's a lot of people out there in Glasgow. There's a lot of people out there within two miles of this church that thinks we're just a bunch of hypocrites. And they're probably more right than we care to admit. But the difference is we know we are. And we're working on it. We're trying so let's let them see that. Let's have a little grace with them. And I think that grace and love will always win the day when nothing else will. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for the witness of Aquila and Priscilla to remind us, Father, of a better way. To remind us that we cannot witness to others 
Father, without your grace, without good understanding, without your word, without you. Help us to remember that, Father, that as we go out, and whoever it is, Lord, that you put into our path, or maybe, maybe they've wronged us. Maybe they've wronged somebody else. Maybe they said something about us and we found out about it and we don't like it. Lord, help us to get past whatever these things are because we may be their only chance. Actually, Lord, we may be what's standing in between them and you. Lord, I don't want that on my hands. Lord, help us to get over ourselves so we can point people to you. We thank you for this message tonight. We thank you for this day. We love you. Please be with us this week. Help us to not just hear your word, but to be doers of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stand with me tonight. Let's sing this song again. I wanted to 